right? So now we're to CSS. So cascading style sheets um, is basically how you can make the web page look awesome, more or less. So what you can do in your web page for now is we have a style tag, style, and then you always want to tell it what type it is. So do you want it to be a closing tag? Yes. <laughs> Type, and then you do um, type text CSS. Um, so it tells it that it's a CSS. And right here we have, you do, uh, so if we wanted to make our header the background, what we do is we select the tag, we do brackets notation. And so basically that's saying, for every header element, do these um, attributes. So within here, we can do background color, and then we can give it, um, there's three ways you can do um, colors in HTML. You can say uh, blue. Um, there's like a set of predefined um, colors, and they have like, you know, number, numbers, markers. Um, so like you can say blue, red, white, green. They're kind of horrendous <laughs> to look at. So like if you refresh the page, that's our blue. <laughs> it's very 1990s. <laughs> Where you can do magenta. I think that's one, right? Magenta. Um, and then from there we evolved in. You can actually do hexadecimals, and so we can do. This is actually my favorite color. Um, so you do <laughs> a hexadecimal, you do that um, hashtag or pound sign. Um, and then it's basically listed at, uh, you have six numbers and it's in hexadecimal, so it ranges from zero to F. Um, if you're not familiar with hexadecimal, go zero to nine and then A through F to get to the 16. And they translate to RGB, so the, um, the zeros are R and the 9 is G and the F is B. So um, that's my favorite color, actually. <laughs> um, so you can do hexadecimal. And then what you can also do is RGB itself, which is really cool. Um, because hexadecimal, you only have, I think, 250? 255? 256. Yeah. But times, I mean, right. 256 for red, 256 for blue, right? So I guess it's not. So you have millions of colors. I mean, so with the RGB, it also goes from 0 to 255. Um, but what's cool about this is like you can do um, 130, 255. I don't know. What color is that? Is that blue? Yeah. Um, so what's really cool is like a lot of designers, they do their um, materials in RGB. And so what's really cool is this resource called Cooler. Um, and basically, it's in Adobe website, but what's really cool about Cooler is people just create palettes um, just for funsies, you know? <laughs> and so you can like pick one more or less. I really like it because you can like, that's a pretty cool color scheme. Mm -hmm. you know? And you can get the colors. Um, if you're on a Mac, you can do the digital color picker or meter, digital color meter. And so, Actually, get the color in RGB right down there. Um, so you can like pick the colors on this. If you're not on a Mac, can you use something like Inkscape that has a similar tool to this? Yeah, or you can like Photoshop and that's where, like download the image, like take a screenshot, download it, open it up in Fireworks or Game or something like that, and get the colors. Um, so it's pretty cool. Let's see what else. So there's a lot of options. Um, Cooler's really cool. Color scheme designer, color hexa, that's one. So if you have a color, you can enter it. Um, and it gives you all these information of like this is RGB, this is CMYK. CMYK is um, cyan, magenta, yellow, black, and that's for print. Um, yeah, and then RGB is for light, certain computers, so it's just different color models. Additive first. 
was it called? I'll sort of add it to whatever it is. That print. Um, and then, yeah, so it has all this fun information. You can get um, these color variations. Um, color variations are really nice for links. A lot of times you pick a color for a link, and then um, there's different things you can do. Let's do it right now. Um, so for links, select it, color. So the color attribute, that tells it what color to display it. So we'll do, um, just do my favorite, 009FF. And then, um, so we have these, uh, we call them, I think, selectors. And basically they're different states for the links. Um, you can remember it as love ha, like, you know, you hate love. And so it's a uh, <laughs> link, and then love visited. these four different states. Um, whenever you want to do a link and you want to style it, you're going to you want to define each one of these. Um, so for a link, that's just your basic. Um, yeah, I think you want to do both just in case. A link is just like the normal link, a link's over the mouse. So then for your visited, um, the uh, general way of doing things is you darken the color. Um, so like um, on the basic web page, it's basically you have this like blue and then the purple. Um, and then so basically this is a link and then this is a visited link. Um, and so they're kind of horrendous colors and that's why you want to color it. So we'll just do a darker color. So we'll do six and then C. Cover generally um, you lighten it. Um, so we'll do zero B and then well, FF is the max. And then active is basically um, you don't see it nowadays as often, but it's basically when you click a link before it actually goes to the web page, that's the color it is. So it's basically like if your web page took forever to load and get off the page, you'll see the um, active color. Well, it's also the color you get while you're holding the mouse button down. Right. Yeah. I can't demonstrate it on my Mac. I know with touchscreen devices, it's right. like impossible to demonstrate. But. Right. And so it's very <laughs> rare, but it's. Nice you really to can't. Demonstrate. There's just, oh, because you don't have like a. You can't hold down the key on your Mac while you're clicking. So in normal browsing, it's a, there you go. Yeah, yeah, there you go. Web page not found. So I can base, if you don't color it, it's red. Um, so yeah. So I'm not quite sure what the standard is on active. Just whatever you want. What are you doing? Let's do black. So if you look, it's nice and blue, nice fun colors. Um, yeah, the other state is just like, your mouse is rolling over it. Um, so then, what else can we style it? Um, color font size. Okay, so basically, what's really cool is um, in the HTML5, and, well, so it's CSS, you have three levels it's one, two, and three, and that's just the different specifications. CSS3 is the current one that they're like trying to get people on. And what's really cool about CSS3 is that you can do different fonts. Um, there's only a small set of like fonts that you can use um, that have been used, just because it's like it's like six fonts that more or less across the board every browser has um, on their computer, and they're kind of ugly. Like it's this tiny new Roman where you got your Arial and that sort of thing. Um, and so what's really cool is you can now do. Um, Um, you can do really cool fonts without, um, you can do more fonts than what originally was available. So for instance, we have the Lost World's Fair. I'm not quite sure who did it, but it's really cool. It's basically demonstrating in a web page, you can do different fonts. So this is not an image. Like you can actually select all this text. Um, and uh, let's see what it is. Like I think you can do, do source. 
So like, this is it. This is our web page. It's not an image. You can actually select the text. Um, it's better to have the text there than an image replacing it for screen readers and accessibility. And so it's really cool that you can do these different kinds of fonts because you can make it look really awesome. But if it needed to, without the style sheet, it can just be a basic web page with all the information still there. Um, so I just, I know, it's just kind of fun. You can see the like the different uses of fonts and that sort of thing. Um, you can go all the way to the bottom. Um, so what you can do is you can host files. You can host font files yourself. So like I do use defont.com. Um, so you can like pick a font that you really like, um, and you can download it. A lot of times it's you can use for personal use. So just don't sell anything using the font. It should be fine. Um, but what gets sticky is uh, there's actually a way you can download the fonts because you're hosting the file. You're hosting the font file within your directory for your website. Um, on the server, so you can actually download the font, and then it's like whoever downloads it can just use it wherever they want. You know? And so that's not quite as kosher. Um, so what you can do is use a Google Web font. It's more or less open source. Google owns all of these fonts, and um, they're allowing you as the designer to pick a font and use it wherever you want. Um, so I'll go ahead and use pick a font. Uh, this one's nice. Uh, this, it takes forever to pick a font, I feel. Um, I kind of like this one. Does CU have a fonts class? CU does, well, they don't, I don't think they teach how to make a font. I mean, but do they have like a typography class? I don't think so. I don't think so. That's always cool. used to have it, I mean, yeah, but like, you know, the total hipster typography nerds, they're always, Tufts used to have a typography yeah. class. UCD has an emphasis right. on typography. Go get in fights about you know what your best font is, and the history of fonts. I mean, it's like people are like into fonts. It's it's a thing. It's, it's, <laughs> it's intense. Yeah, yeah. Helvetica. Have you seen the documentary? No, but I'm familiar with it. <laughs> I'll just pick this font. It's nice and funky. Um, so what you can do, they have different ways of implementing the fonts. The best way, because um, you want. There's been studies, and they've said that people's attention spans for websites has gone down. And so basically, if your web page doesn't load within three seconds, they won't go back to it. And so you want to make it as fast as possible, OK? So what you can do, what the best way is, you take this link here, so you picked your font, and then just new tab, paste. And then you copy this into your style sheet. So in here, I'm going to put it here. And so basically, the, what this is doing, this is CSS3, and it's, uh, it's, it's basically defining that for the font family of Princess Sophia, you're going to use this font style um, or font file. So then from here, what you do is, down here they provide it for you. This is the um, syntax for changing the font family. Um, so what I'm going to do is basically make you my standard font for my whole web page. So I'm going to attach it to the body tag and say font family is this Princess Sophia cursive. So if you wanted it to just be the header, you can... So if you wanted to make the one, if you wanted to use like a different font for the header, then you would put the font family attribute um, within the header block. And it would um, just apply. And it would just apply just to the header elements and any um, children of the header tag. Generally in design, you only want to have like a max of three fonts, and they really need to be like stark contrast. So basically, you want to have like one that is um, sans serif, which is basically if you look um, at so here, this is serif font, and if you look closely, it's um, they have like here on the D. I don't know. They're basically like. F. Oh, there we go, F. So this capital F right here, if you look at it, it, um, I lost it. Any of them will do. The end will work. Yeah, so the end, so basically the serif part is like, there's this like tail kind of on the like 
ends of it, like arms, um, and that's a sans serif, or that's a serif yeah. font. And then a sans serif is, you're looking at it. It's basically here. It's basically it's like it's just a block, you know. So it's like there's no like arms on it. Um, and so it's good to have like a serif font and a sans serif. Um, generally in books and like printed literature, your fonts are going to be serifed, and then on the web, it's going to be sans serif. That's just the convention. Most people actually find it easier to read sans serif on the internet and serif in books. So, let's see what it looks like. So this is our fancy page <laughs> with the font. It's quite awesome. <laughs> uh, so yeah, and then from here you also want to do, so you don't want to like leave it up to chance, the browser styling, because the browser is automatically going to apply their, st their stylings on it. So it's really good to make sure you have font size Defined, and that basically says like how big is the letters. Um, Your styling overrides the browser styling. Correct. But anything you don't specify defaults to the browser. Defaults to the browser. So like if you actually look at the um, specifications for the different block elements, they'll actually tell you how it's styled um, in the different in like the standardization. Uh, yeah, so here, like, here's the typical display properties of the label tag. Um, it's kind of helpful. And then, so yeah, so basically, and then you have, there's different sizings of websites. You have your point, which is PT. It's like your standard 12-point font times your point. Um, and then you can also do pixels, which is like the number of pixels um, on the screen. You can also do EM. So like, if you did one EM, that's basically the, the distance of your end character. So basically it scales all of your font based on the width of your of the M. So like here, that's just one EM, so that's just like 100% regular. So if we look here, it's the same. If we wanted to do two EM, so twice the length of the EM, of the M, then it's twice the size. And so basically it measures how the distance of the M. So yeah, I don't do a point, and then you can also do the same for like, if you want to change your h1 tag to be font size, like just two EMs, so like twice the size, um, it'll just be bigger if you want to like make it massive, whatever the page was. Um, you can do a lot, it takes a lot of practice to style a page. It takes a lot of time to your own care. Um, let's see what else. Oh, so the box model is very important. And it's very complicated. Most browsers, um, back in the day, you had no idea how the browser is going to implement it. Um, but now they're actually trying to make it standardized. So what we have here is you have So basically, here's your box model, more or less, and you have your content, which is basically just going to be the, like, the text. And then within that, you can have padding that goes around the text, and then from there you have your border, and then you have your margin. Okay. And that's generally the box model. Um, yeah, so basically if you want to like set the color or something, it's going to be within the border. Um, the hard part of, that makes it difficult is some browsers will calculate the width of the element, including the border, and some will include it without the border. And so it just gets very complicated. There's now ways to make it standardized of like, I want to use the box model that includes the border model. Um, we can go into that later if you want to talk about words. So basically, so what I'm going to do is I've already colored my header element with this awesome blue, um, but I'm going to decrease this sucker, it's a little big. So background on this, basically I'm going to say margin, uh, 10 pixels, padding, 10 pixels, actually let's do 20, so you can see the difference, and then border, I 
looks a little solid. So basically, in your border tag or your border property, um, you want to give it the, the width, and then you want to give it the style. So you can do like solid, you can do double, you can do dotted, dashed. Um, I think for the most part, people just do solid, and then you go to color. So if we look back here, this is our new um, element. So here, if you do inspect element. We select the header. You can kind of see where the box model is being applied. So it's like orange is your margin, and then you have your border, and then you have your padding. And so that's where it's actually getting implemented. Um, dotted, and then I can make it more pronounced. So you're not forcing an element width here, though. It's no. going to scale with your page yeah. right now. Right now it's going to scale with the page, so if I wanted to make it just like half the size, you give it width, and I can do 50%. So that basically will size it to 50, like half of the window size. Um, you could also do 20 pixels. This is really small. I think for the most part, Oh, great. Right. That's what I wanted to do. Okay, so basically, in both sites, a lot of times it's centered on the page, and that's what this div element is going to come in. So basically, we're going to call it, um, so there's two ways of identifying tags. You can either give it an ID, or you can give it a class. An ID is basically, you only want one element with that ID. So you can say ID of container. So then up here, we can call so for IDs, it's a hashtag, and then for a class, it's a dot. So container, it auto fills for me. Um, generally, a lot of times you do a container that contains your whole website. You give it a margin of zero space auto. And what that does is the first part is um, the top and down, and the second part is the left and right. Um, and you can expand it if you want to like be really specific and do like. Nine pixels and eight pixels and seven pixels. Basically, I remember it as like the compass rows. And so it goes north, left, south, right, whatever. I totally got that wrong. But anyway, <laughs> um, yes, yeah, basically top, right, bottom, left. Okay. It's clockwise. Right. Um, but to center it, we do auto, and that'll just basically say, Whatever it is, make sure it's in the center and it's the same on each, each side. Um, so, and then um, the standard nowadays, or it's kind of changing, but the standard is you do the, you make sure that the width of your website is about 960 pixels, and that works across the board. Um, I know tablet sizes, if you get into mobile, it's much more complicated, um, but for the most part, it's 960. It is kind of increasing with um, monitor sizes since they are getting big. Um, much larger, um, so it's not surprising to see like 1024. Um, so if we look back at our website, it is now centered on the page, and it is constricted to 960 pixels. Um, yeah, more or less. So then, yeah, the container, you can set a background color, more or less. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So can you set, set that to a percentage of the pixels? Yeah, so you can set it to a um, percentage. So if you wanted to make sure that it is 80% you know, all the time, um, it'll do 80%. And if you resize it, it'll just resize it to whatever it is. So you shrink it, it'll just always be 80%. So wouldn't that be better for mobile then? Because it wouldn't depend on size. Right, so you can do it for mobile. Um, the problem is, it gets kind of complicated in the fact that when you're designing a web page, you like to do exact amounts. And so then from there, you can't convert them to percentages, so then it is always the same. Um, but what you run into is if you have like images um, or like other block elements, um, it gets complicated on the height um, because you can't, do the, you can't do the same. You can't define like 80% of the height. Um, and so 
which is like maybe it makes scaling a little bit more difficult because um, the height can change since that's how we scroll. Um, so I mean, you can like for widths it's good, but for heights it gets a little. Could you scale the height as a factor of the width? You can, but then you have to use JavaScript okay. or like some other kind of scripting to um, get it dynamically. You can't just like access the element. It's not quite that high of a language. Um, but yeah, you would use like JavaScript to do the scale, um, more or less. So we have that. I mean, the problem is they're not, they're dependent, right? If you say your width is limited to something, you have to leave the height unlimited because you're going to need to allow your, that's I mean, look what those paragraphs are doing when he shrinks the window, right? Like they're increasing their height. If you limited both, like what would it do, right? I mean, it would be a contradiction. It wouldn't be able to handle it. Yeah. And then that aspect, what you could do if you wanted to make sure it's just that same size, but it's like your text is decreasing, um, you can make it scroll in which it'll basically just like add a scroll bar to whatever the element is. Um, but that's kind of bad form. <laughs> well, you don't see that as often. Um, so right now I'll also do, I don't know about you guys, but I don't like having the bar underneath my links. So what you can do is in your element, um, you can do text uh, decoration, say none. It basically just gets rid of the bar at the bottom, the underline. You so to find like a list of like all the possible things that you can do with that within one within your style sheet. Mm -hmm. Is there a place? Is that like on? Yeah. So the W3C has a list of all of the attributes that you can use. Um, okay. Like similarly to what the HTML that one. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. And so this one's a little bit more in depth. Well, actually, it depends, I think. Um, it's a little bit more complicated because it's like you can use different things for different things. Like, so basically, so it's like you can have your background property, or if you wanted to cite each one individually, then you would append these repeat position image color attachment onto it. And so it's basically it's like, there's just like different ways you can define the different um, attributes that you want to change. Um, I think there's a little bit more to it. Like, there's more attributes than tags, just because you can do a lot with CSS um, and styling. And so, yeah, more or less. Um, what a lot of times what you do is like, if you like how something's styled, you just be the source. Um, and what I really like about Chrome is if I wanted to see how this table is styled, if I look at the element, so we have table, I can go over tables. Um, if you look over here on the side, um, it actually, um, it tells you what CSS styles are being applied to it. And so if you wanted to change it, you can like click it, that got rid of the border. So you can kind of see exactly like how they styled it. Um, it's a very top-down approach, as in whatever is first in the style sheet gets applied, and then everything else beyond that, like if it's redundant, um, gets ignored. So basically, here we have like in their style sheet, they had their body like at the top of their style sheet, and then they had a table, and then they had their classes, and so because. Um, Actually, no, that's their user sketch. So, yeah, so basically, this is their browser. It's saying make the table look like this and that and this. Um, and so, basically, here they're overriding their style sheet um, and saying, no, I don't want my border color to be this solid blue color. Um, and then I guess this leads me to um, CSS Tricks, which is a really wonderful resource. So basically this guy, Chris Coyer, he is just like a web developer, um, and he operates his website. It's really cool because he does a lot with the uh, new standards, and like he pushes the boundaries more or less, and he gives tutorials on things. Um, and so you can like browse his website. Um, he gives snippets on like if you wanted to do, if you wanted to know like box resizing or something. Um, 
my shadow, you can do a sh drop shadows. Um, he has all these like snippets. So like he says, you can look and gradient text. So he tells you how to do the gradient text. So here's the CSS and then here's the example. Um, this is a really cool resource. Um, I use it a lot just to be like, how do you do this? Um, yeah. So then that's a cool resource. Yeah, CSS3. Uh, the developer network is also a really cool resource in which you can um, it's just like another reference manual if you want to use that instead of the W3C. They're a little bit more user friendly um, than the W3C since the W3C is more bureaucratic in their aspect and so it's a lot of documentation that you really don't need. Um, that's a really cool resource. Uh, colors. Um, yeah, there's just a like different, there's a lot of different colors that, like pickers. 3 to 255 is pretty cool. You give it a color and it gives you all the different um, yeah, like color. And color, there you go. And so it gives you all the like different um, gradients. Um, let's see. Yeah, so for the most part it's just like seeing out what's out there and how do you do it. Um, just applying it. You just apply the same thing like this. Um, yes, let's see. I think we're here. Do you normally keep CSS in the file like this, or do you do it in a separate file? Um, so basically, you always want to have an external um, style sheet so that it's not part of your web page, um, since it makes it load faster. So what you're going to do is, what we're going to do is we're going to take all of our styling, we're going to cut it, open the new file, paste it, and then we're going to save it within the same directory. Um, name it style.css. So that's just a style sheet. Um, and you save it. And then back here, we can get rid of this part. <coughs> and we do the link. And we give it, I think it's href. You give it the link of style.css. So that's basically just going to the style sheet. So anything you put in the style sheet will be applied to this document. So if we look here, it shouldn't change. Or it did. I always forget. Because you basically do it once and then forget about it. Do you need to do rel style sheet? So basically, so rel style sheet, oh maybe. So basically the rel attribute um, is good for what search engines, they use it. It basically tells you its relationship to the other documents. So for here it's style sheet. Yeah, that's it. So basically it's telling the browser that this is my style sheet. Um, you can also do rel is good for search engine optimization. So for instance, if you have an external link like to Wikipedia, if you do rel no follow, and that basically tells the like web crawlers that Wikipedia is not part of my website, so don't include their page ranking with mine. Um, it's just nice to like keep it clean and like cut the ties to other websites if you do a link outside of it. It doesn't really affect the display, but um, text-align things, so if you wanted all your paragraphs to be the right text align, you can do right. There you go. So basically it's all on the right now. Um, yeah. There's a lot of things you can do. CSS now. Um, let's see. I mean, I think I got my number, all of my CSS. Um, 